What's up guys, Sagi here and welcome to another Tech Gear Talk. Let me ask you a question. Can you use an entry level camera and get professional looking portraits? Is it true that the only way to get shallow depth of field is to use a full frame sensor camera? And what are the two things you absolutely need to do to improve your photography? Today, Christy and I are gonna show you how to get great portraits anywhere using inexpensive gear. And again, it was really important for me to use entry level equipment because as much as I love gear, there's a lot more to photography and video than how much you spend. I'm also gonna choose terrible shooting conditions, ones that I would never go out and shoot in because I feel like once you get comfortable enough with your gear to shoot in challenging environments, it's always easy to then go ahead and apply those same skills when the conditions are better. All right, so let's start out and talk about gear. And as I mentioned, I'm gonna use entry-level equipment to really keep the cost down. So you're not gonna see me bring out the a7 III or the EOS R or the X-T3, all of those are staying at home. Instead, I chose the Canon SL2, which currently sells brand new for under 500 bucks, and you can get it used for even less than that. And this is very much an entry-level camera. It's light, it's portable, and it also does a great job for video. Now, another budget option is the Canon M50, but I was really trying to keep the price down. And the lens that I'm gonna use is the Canon 50 millimeters f1.8, which currently sells for 125 bucks. Again, that's brand new, and I'm sure you can save a couple bucks if you buy it used. And I want you to notice that I'm not using the f1.4 or the f1.2 because that would increase the price by a factor of three or even more than 10 respectively. Now, both of the other lenses are great options and they definitely have their advantages, but I'm gonna choose to spend my money on lighting instead. And I decided to go with a combo pocket flash and trigger. So I'm using the Godox 8200 Pro and the X-Pro-C trigger. Now, the light itself can work with any camera, and I chose the X-Pro-C trigger because the C stands for Canon, which makes it compatible with the SL2. Now, Godox also makes the S model for Sony, the N model for Nikon, the F for Fuji, P for Pentax, and O for Olympus and Panasonic, and the trigger sells for under 70 bucks. Now, the 8200 Pro is an upgraded version of the 8200, and there are definitely some advantages like faster recycle times, but the non-Pro model would work just as well. Now, depending on how bright it is, you might actually be able to get away with using a speed light, but I recommend going with something like this because it will work for you when you need more power, and then at the same time, you can always turn the power down when you need less light. And this way, you're keeping things simple and you're only learning how to use one piece of gear. Now, the Pro version sells for $349 and the original sells for $299, so it's not a big difference and it's probably something that you won't need to replace and will always have use for. What's great about both of the lights is they offer a bare bulb and a Fresnel head. And both offer high speed sync, which is critical for what we're gonna do today, and I'll explain why in a minute. This light also doesn't require that I use a dedicated receiver to communicate with the trigger, because the receiver is built right into the light. So again, less moving parts and a simpler setup. Now, any light this size is gonna be pretty hard if I'm gonna point it right at the subject, so I'm going to go ahead and diffuse it. This is the first element that's critical to improving your photography, that's quality of light. Now, regardless of what type of photography or video you do, you need to be aware of the quality of the light. A hard light is going to create very defined shadows, which might look really cool in an architectural shot or street photography, but it's not what I want for this portrait. I'm using a 43 inch umbrella softbox, which I bought used for five bucks because one of the ribs was broken. You can buy brand new for $22. I have some really great modifiers from Westcott, and if you watched my FJ400 video, you can see them there. But I'm using this broken umbrella because I wanted to show you what you can get without spending a ton of money. And I'll link to the Westcott video at the end in case you want a more powerful light. Back to the umbrella, it's gonna give me soft and diffuse light, and it's also super portable because it folds down. Now, another thing that I like about this particular umbrella is that there's a reflective material on the inside. So the whole inside of this umbrella is silver. So instead of pointing the light out and have it just go right through this diffusion material, I'm actually gonna point it back into the umbrella. I'm gonna have it fill the entire reflective surface and then have it bounce out through this diffusion material. And that's gonna give me an even softer look. Now, if you watched any of my other lighting tutorials, you already know that the larger the source of light relative to your subject, the softer it is. So I'm gonna use a big source and I'm gonna bring it close to Christy. And again, because I want as much spread as possible, I'm gonna use the bare bulb head on the 8200 Pro instead of the Fresnel. I could I use the other head? Of course, but since I have the option here, I'm gonna go ahead and use the bare bulb. 
Now the last two pieces of gear that I need are a light stand and a mount. Again, nothing too expensive. The grip was under 20 bucks and I got two light stands for $25. Now remember in the beginning that I said that I wouldn't shoot in these conditions? Well, if you're starting out, you may think that a bright and sunny day is the perfect time to go shooting because there's plenty of light. But in reality, the sun is a small and extremely bright light source, which leaves very hard shadows. So right now I'm filming in the shade so I can get an even light on myself. But if I was sitting in the light, it would be very, very harsh. Now this sounds counterintuitive because the sun is huge. So how could it be a small source of light? But the sun is so far away, so if you actually think of the size of it when you see it in the sky, you compare it to a source of light, it's tiny. And again, it creates very defined shadows. And just as a reminder, I'm showing you that this setup is gonna work in these conditions because once you master this process, then you end up going out on an overcast day, then it would be even easier. And an overcast day is much better for portraits because the clouds act as a giant softbox. So they diffuse the sunlight and they produce a much more even and flattering light. And before I get to the actual shooting part, if you like what you've seen so far, let me know by giving this video a thumbs up. It helps me know what kind of content you guys like so that I can make more of it. And if it's your first time here, go ahead and hit the subscribe and notification buttons so you can stay up to date on all the latest gear and tutorials. All right, so let's get to shooting and we're gonna use our light as the key light. And if I was shooting in the studio, I would start there. But out here, I can't control everything. So the first thing I need to worry about is the position of the sun. We already know that I don't want the sun on Christy's face because that's gonna create some really harsh shadows. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna position Christy with her back to the sun. That way I'm gonna use the sun as a hair or rim light. And what I'm looking at when I'm doing this is the angle of the light as well as what's behind Christy because that's gonna be in the frame. And that brings us to the second critical element of improving your photography the direction of the light. So after choosing what type of light you're going to use, you then have to think of where you're going to position it so that you can light your subject exactly how you want. All right, now let's move on to the actual exposure. And we have a ton of light here, so there's absolutely no reason not to shoot at ISO 100. And this is gonna give us the cleanest image possible. I'm also gonna shoot in JPEG and RAW, so I have a JPEG if I wanna quickly share an image. And then I also have the RAW if I wanna do some more work in post. As far as aperture, this lens opens all the way to f1.8, and I see no reason not to use it in this situation to get a lot of separation. And this is a stylistic choice. There's plenty of photographers that like to shoot wide open, and then there are other photographers that like to close down the aperture and get a deeper depth of field. So it's really up to you and how you want your images to look. Now I wanna show you what would happen if I try to take this shot just with available light and expose for Christie's face. I'm going to completely blow out any areas that are getting hit by the sun, which includes the background. So obviously this isn't gonna work for what I'm trying to accomplish. Now if I was in the studio, I would just turn down the backlight, but out here the sun is as bright as it is and there's nothing I can do about it. So I'm gonna go about getting the look that I want another way. The first thing I'm gonna do is expose my shot for the background. I'm shooting in manual mode and I already have my ISO at 100 and my aperture selected. So the only thing that's left to change is the shutter speed. Now, because my shot is too bright, I know that I need a faster shutter speed, which will let less light onto the sensor. There isn't a setting that's gonna work for everyone because it will depend on how bright it is where you are. But the good thing here is that we're shooting digitally, so we can immediately see the results. And if you wanna see the results before taking the picture, you can just flip on live view while you're setting the exposure, and you can also turn on the histogram. Now I'll show you the results on the screen and remember that if you wanna darken the background, you're going to shorten your shutter speed. If you wanna brighten the background, you're going to lengthen it. And I'm gonna to continue to take test shots until I get the background to look exactly how I want. And while I'm doing this, I'm not worried about how my subject's face looks because I'm gonna take care of that later. Okay, so I have the background the way that I want and the issue here is that Christy is way too dark because the only light that's reaching her face is light being reflected from the surrounding. Remember that earlier I said that it's important that we use a light with high speed sync. So here's why. If you try to use a light that's not capable of high speed sync, then you won't be able to shoot at a faster shutter speed than your camera's native sync speed. And let me explain that. Most cameras have a native speed sync of somewhere between 200 to 250th of a second, where anything faster than that is beyond the camera's ability to sync the shutter with the flash. And what will happen if you try to shoot at a faster shutter speed is that only part of your photo will be properly exposed by the flash and the rest of it would be too dark. I'll do a dedicated video to explain why that is. And so if you're interested, 
go ahead and make sure that the notification button is set to all. Back to high speed sync, this is where our light comes to the rescue. I turn the light on and then the trigger and I'm shooting in manual mode on the light as well so I can have full control and I make sure that I have high speed sync selected on both. I position the light at about 45 degrees to Christy's side, sometimes a little bit less depending on how I want to light her face. And the advantage of this bigger source, meaning using the umbrella, is that the light is soft and it's gonna wrap around more of her face and then it's gonna gently fall off the other side. I'll take a test shot at whatever settings I last use and then I'll make adjustments. If I need more light, I'll turn it up in the trigger and if I need less light, again, I can just set that right in the trigger. It's super easy. My goal here is to add enough light to properly expose Christy. And since I'm already exposed for the background, it's just a matter of adding the right amount of light. Again, I'm not gonna focus on my exact settings because what I'm trying to show you are the steps that you need to take. If the sun is brighter where you are, you'll need more light to balance it. If it's less bright, you'll need less light. So it doesn't matter what I'm using, you just need to follow these steps until you get the proper exposure. And I think it's important that you become very intentional about your shots instead of letting the camera dictate things for you. There's no right or wrong here. Every photographer has different preferences. Some like to darken the background and then add more light because it makes the subject really pop. And then others would like a more natural look with a more balanced exposure. And even within those two extremes, there are degrees. I don't worry about light meters or getting the right ratios. I just take a picture, I look at it, I make an adjustment. I might like a certain look today with one subject and then a completely different look next week with a different subject in different conditions. I think it's more important that you know how to achieve the results that you want rather than being stuck with a single look. So go out and shoot. You can see the images right on the back of the camera. You can experiment with different options and then come home, take a look at them and see what you like best. And if you don't like any of them, delete them all and go ahead and shoot again. Well, actually, no, don't delete them. Keep them so you can use them as reference. Now, I wanna go back now and revisit where we started this tutorial. As I mentioned, I wouldn't normally shoot in direct sunlight on such a bright day. If I had to shoot in these conditions, then I would pick an area that wasn't in direct light, like where I'm sitting right now, and that way I would have a softer light to start with. But I thought it was important to walk you through this process under challenging conditions for a few reasons. First, I want you to see that it's not that bad and it's not that scary. And second, because if you can make it work in this situation, you'll have no problems when the conditions are better. I can't always be out there shooting during golden hour, and even when I am, it's very limiting in terms of how long I can shoot. Adding a strobe means that you have much more flexibility. And even if you're shooting in ideal conditions, it's still a powerful tool to help improve your images. And the total cost of all the items that I used today was right around $1,100. And while that's quite a bit of money, it's nowhere near some of the setups that I see using a $4,000 camera and a $2,000 lens and then super expensive lighting. This is also a really versatile setup and you can continue to build on it by adding another light or two, use different modifiers, and slowly expand what you can create. I'll put links in the description to all the items that I talked about in this video, as well as a few other options. And if you buy anything using those links, you help support my channel for free and you allow me to create more content. So thank you in advance. Ultimately, it's not important to me that you use the same gear that I do. I just want you to use whatever gear works for you. I really hope that this portrait on a budget tutorial was helpful. If it was, please let me know by giving this video a thumbs up, tweet it, share it, and if you haven't yet, hit the subscribe and notification buttons. You can always find me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Tech Gear Talk. You know what I always say, buy it nice or buy it twice. Good luck and see you soon.